Okay. All right. So today's CT, the third one is going to be on art and debating art motions. Uh, first, a quick welcome back. Uh, so this time we have a, um, a meme that says this horse looks at people. Uh, yeah, this is your welcome back slide for the day. I think there's people in the waiting room. Wait, I'm just going to admit people. Okay, cool. So in terms of updates and announcements, this is just a brief prelude. This will be the last fully online CT. Um, and But next week, Bogwall attendees are going to be coming to CT. So the workshop for this will be held online, but we're going to have an in-person debate at the Pleasance afterwards. I think we have a booking now for like 8 p.m. So thanks so much to Bryn for organizing that for us. Um, I just realized, I think I forgot to put like formatting on these slides. So I think they're all like all of the, um, all the paragraphs are going to come up at once, which is kind of annoying, but like uh, we move. <laughs> People who read fast are going to be really annoyed by this. Okay, cool. Uh, before I get into this workshop, a few recommendations. Uh, so these are the three workshops that I like looked at that I found quite helpful. The first one is a Manchester Debate Union one. It's very much practical applications to motions, and most of it's going it, to it it is based on like representation of like minority groups, which is like more things that um more things that tend to come up in debates. Like they talk about specific clashes that come up in debates all the time. The other one that's by Ron is more like conceptual and vague. Um, it's still helpful because I think it it's probably all right and good to learn specific arguments for debates, uh, but it probably helps if you can come up with some unique ones by having a better understanding of like the function and purpose of art and stuff. And then the last one by Enting is kind of a mix of the two. Um, Cool. So I'm starting this off with like yet another disclaimer, which is that I don't study art and I don't really like claim to understand art to a huge extent. But I have what I have done is like done a bit of reading and watched a lot of workshops by people who clearly know a lot more than me. Uh, and that's what most of this debate is going to be about. I study chemistry, guys. I don't like I don't have a huge understanding of like uh, conceptual art or anything like that. But, you know. We move. Uh, okay, part one of this workshop, meaning, value, and function of art. So I'm going to start this off with like kind of a uh, general question. What comes to mind when you think of art? So does anyone want to unmute and answer this question? Anyone at all? Is it like paintings and stuff? Paintings and stuff. Yeah, that's like a good answer. Anybody else? Just like anything created to fulfill some kind of aesthetic purpose, I guess, which can also carry some other meaning. Yeah, so that's more of a definition of art. Uh, so fulfilling an aesthetic purpose, yeah, definitely. Um, so generally speaking, what can be classified as art is incredibly broad. So not only is it kind of ranging a lot of different mediums, but also there's certain things that like would be considered art by some people and not considered art by other people. The definition of art or like where you draw the line when something ceases to be art is pretty like, uh, it's a pretty personal and subjective thing. Um, again, so how would you then define art? So the answer that Adam gave there is something that fulfills an aesthetic purpose. Does anyone else have like a definition of art that they can think of? Any um, creative expression or manifestation in whatever range of media. Yeah, media. So, so art is usually a creative expression. So uh, a lot of the time it can be like an expression of somebody's identity or their emotions or experiences or something like that. Um, does anybody else have something they would also consider a definition of art? I'm going to start calling on specific people soon because I think we need a we need a bit of like liveliness in these workshops, right? Nav, do you have a definition of art? I am art. You are. Um, art. No, no, anything that like the creator wants to be art in a sense that has like that there's some sort of threshold of aestheticness I guess but that yeah. threshold is arbitrarily defined yeah so a, a big part of what we would consider art is something with an art, artistic intent so the creator like wants it to be art or like decides that should be art so I'm I'm asking a lot of open questions but I think this is kind of 
important for all of us to explore, like maybe something we haven't thought about before. Would you consider this picture, well, not the picture itself, like, uh, so obviously photography is art, but would you consider the subject of this picture, which is the Grand Canyon, to be art? It does fulfill an aesthetic purpose, Adam. So would you consider it to be art? Uh, I mean, that was far from a comprehensive definition, but yeah, I think you can argue this to be art. Um, I mean, the simple explanation for arguing this to be art would be if you argued that it was created by like a god or something. But even if you take that out of the equation and you argue that it was created just over an extremely long time by movements of the earth and that kind of thing, I think you can still argue it to be art, um, even if that's not its primary purpose, in that it can be interpreted that way. And maybe that's another foul definition. Cool. So I think uh, I think that you're correct in saying that there is again our, the definition of art is pretty much entirely subjective. I think when it comes to like a more grounded approach, something that you can use in a debate context, we would assume that like a feature of nature isn't considered art. So that kind of raises the question then, like why do we normally when we do an art debate, why does nobody talk about the Grand Canyon? or like uh, any other like natural wonder of the world or like natural feature. And it's generally the thing that now I've talked about, which is that it lacks artistic intent. Again, unless you fiat that there's like a God who created the world or something that intended this to be artistic in some way, um, you, it kind of lacks that intent. There's also another working definition of art that a lot of people use, which is that art is a represent, is anything that is a representation of another thing. So this, Grand, the Grand Canyon isn't a representation of anything, it just is. Um, uh, and then I think there's also uh, some definitions of art will stipulate specifically that art is something that's created for, to fill an aesthetic purpose by a person. So that, those would all be things that are exclusionary of the Grand Canyon. I do appreciate that like a lot of people might consider this art, it's just normally you wouldn't, and in a debate context, you wouldn't consider this art. Uh, cool, is this art? Um, does anyone want to answer if they think the Large Hadron Collider is art? Cece, do you think this is art, out of curiosity? I actually I had a slightly unrelated question. Is Go God art? Is if, God art? <laughs> if someone worships, say, a deity or something, is that deity art? I think that's a fascinating question, but I would assume because deities can't be created by anything else, right? That they couldn't be art. But yeah, you know, I think um, I, I don't want us to get too sidetracked here. So does anybody think the Large Hadron Collider is art or does anyone have a strong opinion that it, it is not art? Feel free to unmute and discuss. So Matthew, mm -hmm. you said it has artistic qualities, but is not art in and of itself. What do you mean by artistic qualities? Like presumably that a certain amount of the design of it would be done with the artistic sense, an aesthetic sense to it, but because its primary purpose is doing physics, um, it's not, it's not an art, a work of art, but there are clearly artistic decisions made alongside the practical decisions. Yeah, Isn't exactly. Yeah. So when we when we talk about art, a lot of the time a consideration is what the primary function of the object or thing is. So you could consider like a let's say I have a dining room table, like many of the aspects of that dining room table are designed with aesthetics in mind. But for the most part, I wouldn't consider it to be art or I wouldn't go to an Ikea showroom and look at all the furniture and, and consider most of it art. I think furniture can be art if its primary function is aesthetic or artistic, but most of the time its function is just to like put uh, bowls and plates on, right? So something like the Large Hadron Collider, you're correct in that there's decisions that were probably made with aesthetic in mind, but the intent behind it is not art, even though it also may evoke some emotions in me, like awe or like inspiration or something at like the marvels of the human race or something um, that art might provoke in me. Because that wasn't the intent, we usually wouldn't consider it to be art. Okay, next question, is this art? I think I've kind of already discussed this when I talked about the role of a table. So like, we wouldn't consider a toilet to be art, even if there, there's a consideration for aesthetics when the person who designed the toilet made the toilet or drew up the plans for the toilet. Um, okay, but is this art? So this is a, this is Fountain by Duchamp. Has anyone, ooh, has anyone heard of this before? Um, somebody said found, Key, and what does found object mean? 
I think that these were like a, well, Duchamp had like a series of found object things where he just wrote like a name on it in a year. And then it was like just arbitrary objects were chosen to be art. I think in, in some way it was like, uh, I don't know if this was exactly what it was, but like it was the statement that art is in some way art because it is tied to the art world or it's just tied to other people that associate themselves with artworks. And in that way, art can just become art because it's a part of what people consider to be art. So I don't know. Yeah, exactly. So that's it's that's both about like intent. So that Duchamp intended this to be an art piece. So even though it is also like something that you urinate into, just like the last slide had a toilet on it, um, it's this is unique and this is art because the intent makes it art. Uh, and then there's also the other aspect of it, which is the audience interpretation. So the fact that this was placed in an art gallery alongside portraits means that it is art because people perceive it to be art. Um, cool. So when we're, this is the working definition that you get if you Google what is art, which is the expression or application of human creative skills and imagination in a visual form, like painting, sculpture, producing works. So uh, I think this is a perfectly fine working definition. It's pretty broad. I think the important qualities that you probably have to remember when you're deciding what art is, is that you're provoking an emotional response, whether that's positive, negative, whether that emotion is like happiness or disgust or lust or anything and the this uh pro provoking of emotion is done with intent and purpose on behalf of the artist so they want to provoke a specific emotion and the primary function of whatever your whatever the piece is is to do is to have provoke this emotional response cool so things that fall under the umbrella of art what are you normally going to be talking about paintings and sculpture so a lot of people in art motions tend to get bogged down specifically in paintings and sculptures but it, it's probably more useful to talk about things that um things that have a like a broader societal impact nowadays which are things like literature film music theater games fashion a lot of things, again, can be considered art, but these are things that most heavily feature in like popular culture. So it can, can be kind of useful to remember that are probably going to be your frame in an art motion if you want to have like many impacts. Cool. So then what makes art valuable? This is another interesting question. Uh, does anybody have an answer to this? How about somebody who hasn't unmuted yet? Um, so Amina, what makes art valuable in your opinion? Um, I have unmuted. You break my heart, but oh, uh, sorry. <laughs> it's fine, I'm kid. Um, but I think maybe one element is emotional value. So whatever emotions it invokes. So you mentioned about the Large Hadron Collider. It can inspire you. It can uh, inspire some kind of awe or that kind of thing. Maybe revolutionary art has an emotional purpose. So on. But that's just one of the elements. Yeah. So emotional purpose. Sometimes this could be like a positive. Uh, positive emotion so it's good because it makes you happy or it provides a an ability for you to have some kind of escape from your normal life but then you also mentioned like revolutionary art so radical art can deconstruct ideas or concepts uh, or change the way you view something so things like this okay now we're, we're going to be talking about some of the like components of art this is so this is this first slide so on the left this is Pieta uh, uh, which I'm sure everybody is familiar with. And on the right, we have a restoration of a fresco in Spain. Um, can anybody like maybe come up with some things that they think are different about these two pieces? They're the same image. They're the same. Uh, what Adam said, debating speeches. <laughs> what do you mean by this, Adam? Sorry. Eating. Uh, that was back when you were listing all the different things that would be considered forms of art. I think, yes, a speech can definitely be a form of art for sure. Yeah. Um, do you, Adam, do you think, what do you think the primary difference is between these two works? Like just intuitively? I mean, one of them looks like, you know, the culmination of a massive amount of effort and it's a fantastic depiction of, you know, something that's very realistic and lifelike and impressive and skilled. And the other one is, it looks like the Ab and Ab grew at like 3 a.m. after going to Hive. Yep. Yeah, so uh, so this is when we're going to be talking about like the aesthetic value of art. So Michael, Michelangelo, very talented 
uh, artist, for instance, has could have like depict say like David or something has a depiction of a human figure that's very realistic. There's a huge amount of mastery and skill that goes into it. Every detail from how the muscles to the veins are all modeled to like cloth is kind of really beautiful to look at. Whereas something like on the right just isn't particularly aesthetically pleasing. Um, Cool. So again, all of these slides don't have like formatting on them. That's my fault. Um, so formative and aesthetic value. So beauty can be found in things like harmony, balance, rhythm, shape, color, some uh, kind of sonic quality if we're talking about music. Um, most of these things being fairly universal. Uh, and a lot of these are displays of technique and mastery. So the composition themselves, uh, the combination of these elements shows some kind of technical know-how or experience. So uh, which is informed through the knowledge of the medium, right? So you can be a talented sculptor or a painter or whatever. Uh, so uh, this is a pretty intuitive mode of evaluation. So when we're talking about uh, whether or not an art piece is valuable, it's pretty like clear something's quite beautiful, like why people might want to look at it or listen to it or whatever. Um, and while some aspects of what's typically considered beautiful does transcend culture and geography, other aspects are socially informed in the same way that like beauty in some people uh, does also. Uh, we also see this through like trends in art where like say um, impressionism becomes popular for a while and people find it to be particularly aesthetically valuable versus in other times where maybe they don't. Um, does art have to be beautiful in the traditional sense to have aesthetic value? I don't think I really uh, need anyone to chime in here because I think I assume most people know it probably doesn't. So we have all of these art pieces. None of them I would consider like traditionally beautiful in like most senses of the word. So um, we have like this sculptor, which like um, I think it's called like Momo. That's just this really creepy looking face. Uh, we have this painting on the top uh, right, which is of like, it's kind of like a almost like lonely scene of like a woman in a field looking back at like a, a, a farmhouse. Um, we have uh, garden, the Garden of Earthly Delights, which is kind of this horrifying painting by Hieronymus Bosch. Um, all of these I wouldn't consider particularly like traditionally having the quality of beauty. But what I would say is that all of them have aesthetic value, which is through things like their composition, the skill that the painter had when they made them or whatever. So while like beauty is an intuitive way of deciding if you, we value something, it doesn't necessarily, uh, beauty and aesthetics aren't like the same thing, right? Cool, and then here's a question. Why would less people be interested in seeing a painting that is a forgery or a copy versus an original work? Uh, does anyone want to chime in here? I guess the artist has like some sort of value to them or their name or their brand. And if it's a forgery, you don't have that narrative of that particular artist attached to it because that artist has built like this narrative over, I don't know, X number of years or by being, I don't know, some, like, but yeah, whatever. Yeah, so I guess what you're kind of talking about there is the experiential value of like seeing a painting. So uh, when I go and see the Mona Lisa in the Louvre, it's not just the fact that I'm going to see the Mona Lisa itself and that the painting is like quite a nice painting. It's also the experience of like the location. It's the fact that everybody there who's like in a huge crowd taking pictures, there's a lot of like clear indicated social value to the painting. It's the fact that maybe I've learned about the painting very early in life and I know it's incredibly iconic. It's kind of the mystery or the mythos that surrounds the painting. So like that the Mona Lisa has a mysterious smile. Uh, it's like all of the context that, that the painting exists in. So the value of art isn't just, oops, it's not just in its form, but it's also in ideas and associations that it has. So, um, uh, one, I get one aspect of this is perceived artistic intent. So one reason why people might not want to see a forgery, for instance, is because the intent of the original artist was to create like a work that would evoke emotions in people, whereas the intent of the person committing the forgery, generally their motive is profit. Uh, and then when it, again, when it comes to copies, um, the intent of the original artist was to fulfill an artistic vision that came to them out of their own creativity or uh, work or ingenuity, whereas the person copying doesn't have that same intent. So there's a couple of images here. The first one on the left is a painting. Uh, this painting was, this was painted by Hitler. So 
knowing that context probably changed the way that you perceived the painting initially. Like you might have seen it first, thought it wasn't an especially notable one, but it's like fairly okay painting. Uh, and now that you know the background, you're probably you probably like the painting less, right? Uh, and then on the right, we have like, this is Pepe the Frog. You probably already know the context of Pepe the Frog, uh, that they, this frog was used as a symbol by a lot of hate groups. But there's also the fact that the uh, initial like artistic intent, so the guy who made Pepe the Frog just made him for his uh, comic, I believe. And the guy has like since denounced all of the other uses of Pepe the Frog and has asked people to please stop using him for like, um, like alt-right memes and stuff but that doesn't really matter because the context surrounding Pepe the Frog has still shifted. Um, cool and so now we get on to the next part so aside from the aesthetic value or the formative value we have the cognitive or intellectual or interpretive value of art so this is about how we interpret the art aside from the actual form itself so this could be we could interpret it having exploration of deeper ideas, meanings, or concepts. Uh, it could be, these could be including like things like critique or, dis, or deconstruction or subversion or some kind of like radical um, exploration of ideas. It could be moral, political, or religious me messages, uh, cultural mythos, status, and background. So we talked about that briefly with like the Mona Lisa. So sometimes a very famous painting continues to be famous and continues to be beloved just because it was famous to begin with. Uh, and then also uh, art as a method for social inquiry. So uh, Duchamp's fountain makes us question the nature of art itself if a urinal that is signed, that is placed in a gallery can also be considered art. So there's quite a lot of like examples here. We have like quite a few that are political. So silence equals death is like, uh, so the pink triangle was initially like a Nazi symbol that they would force gay men in concentration camps to wear and was since co-opted and like reclaimed by some parts of the LGBT community to be used in uh, as like an evocative or provocative symbol uh, in like political art or political activism. Um, we have there's this painting uh, just in the bottom middle by Banksy, which is a painting that gets that I believe it was at an auction. And then as soon as it was purchased, it was shredded instantly. So this is, again, something that's more like social inquiry. So we're wondering, like, what is the nature of art? Uh, when you can purchase a painting that destroys itself. Um, we have something like Fleetwood Max Rumors, which is a, an album that is a lot more enjoyable, in my opinion, if you know the context behind, um, be, behind the album, which is that two of the members of Fleetwood Mac were going through a messy divorce at the time. Um, and then we also have some other examples that you might be familiar with. So like Get Out is obviously a commentary on like uh, rate, a race, the racial climate in the US at the time it was made. Um, so knowing that context can enhance your viewing experience. Things like these. Cool. Um, so what are the factors that are important to consider when we're talking about context or interpretive value? So this could be historical context and timeliness. So one example that's on this slide is this is Captain Kirk kissing Uhura on Star Trek, which I believe was the first interracial kiss shown on television. So while it wouldn't be notable if it happened now, it was at the time and had like kind of a political message. Uh, also just intent of the artist. Uh, ingenuity, creativity, and uniqueness. So if something's done for the first time, it's obviously going to be somewhat more valuable or notable at least. Discourse surrounding the work. So provocation or how radical a piece of work was. And then also co-option and reinterpretation. So we also have something like Triumph of the Will, which was a Nazi propaganda movie where the director asked people uh, to consider the movie in absence of its context, basically because it was like quite a well-filmed mo movie uh, and invented a lot of like cine uh, techniques in like filmmaking at the time and had like, well, I guess, quite a large budget. But obviously it's impossible to divorce this movie from the context in which it was produced, which is that it was made as Nazi propaganda. Uh, and then we also have the Mona Lisa again. Cool. Uh, and there we have, so just talking a bit about formative versus interpretive value and how they interplay. So neither can really exist independently. You can't have meaning in art without form or form without meaning. So for instance, that terrible restoration we talked about before, while the intent is obviously to have a depiction of Christ, um, the 
we can't really access that meaning properly when the form isn't uh, facilitating that access. And then we also have something like uh, like Rothko, which is like, so Rothko did a lot of art where there were a lot of like shades of different colors of red, uh, but it's all quite like, um, it's all quite, it's all quite like difficult to interpret or resistance to interpretation. Uh, but you still kind of, there's still, people have still managed to extract meaning out of it because you can't really have form without meaning. Um, and both can contribute to an overall experiential value of a work. Um, did someone have a question? Feel free to unmute. Yeah, um, is abstract art to an extent meaning without form? Like if you just draw a line on a paper, that ha like imagine that has like narratives around like social issues in India, isn't that meaning without form? Because I, I don't know. I think if, if art, so abstract art can have meaning, but most abstract art does have like form. So there's usually still like some level of effort or technique put into producing it. Um, I guess in cases where there isn't, like there's there still has to be some kind of a form. So even the line drawn in the page is still like a form. So even like the urinal that we talked about before, the urinal is the form. It's not a form that's that we would consider to have a lot of aesthetic value. But I guess in this instance, um, the uh, the sorry the the formative value just isn't as important in that context. Um, I mean, you similarly have painters who just did like paintings of landscapes that do have meanings because you can't like have a painting that has no meaning, but it, it's that they, uh, the formative value took precedence in that instance. Um, so the experiential value of a work encompasses how all aspects contribute to the emotional response of the viewers, uh, whatever that response may be. And the job of the artist is to curate these two aspects to fulfill their artistic vision. So whatever their creativity is driving them to make within the context in which that piece of art exists. So when we're talking about assigning value to artwork, it is very complex because we have to consider our senses, our emotions, our in intellectual opinions, our will, our desires, culture, preferences, values, subconscious behavior, conscious decision, training instinct, sociological institutions, all of which are so subjective and so personal. Uh, okay, on to the next slide. So who owns art? Does anybody have an instant answer that they just that is just a reflex when they hear this question? Rich people who'd like to avoid taxes. <laughs> You're absolutely not wrong. You're really not wrong. Um, does anybody else have a have an answer to this? Um, the British government. The British government. <laughs> true. So true. Um, yeah, people, people who stole it. Stage. Oh, sorry. Like the community through the state. Sure. Uh, Cece, what were you going to say? White people who stole it. White people who stole it. Yeah. D depending. I mean, these are all true. Sorry, Callum, go ahead. Uh, depending how old that art is, potentially all of us. Yeah, or potentially all of us. So um, things, things that eventually come into the public domain or the original artist is now unknown whoever created it. So I think a previous slide had the Venus of Waldorf. It's hard to argue that any specific person can claim ownership of that, obviously, at this point. Um, right, so who owns art? Uh, so this is kind of on the implications of subjectivity. So when art comes into being, there's kind of a threefold process that's going on here. So first you have the artistic intent or the vision for what the art should be. And we have the process of creating that piece of art. So using your talent or your mastery of a certain craft in a medium in order to make your vision a reality. And then lastly, we have the interpretation of the art by the audience. Um, again, within their social context. The final step is where the artist has to surrender control of the value of their work to the audience because they don't get to participate in this step. Um, so the overall experiential value, which is kind of dictated by the audience, um, it can be curated, but only to an extent. So you can own the formative value of your work, mostly. So you can own a painting or you can own the intellectual property to the character Mickey Mouse if you invented Mickey Mouse, if you are Walt Disney or whatever. But you can't dictate how people perceive that piece of work. You can't control the interpretive value of the work, which contributes, again, to the overall experiential value. So to a certain extent, the artist's uh, the, the full artistic process can't happen with an artist alone. You need an audience and the artist can't really control how the audience reacts. Um, but also in a way, when we're talking about ownership, we're talking about 
the, uh, we're talking about who's contributing their labor towards a piece of art. So included in interpretation are things like discourse or discussion of works of art or critique. Um, and to a certain extent, the audience are performing that labor, they're doing that. So they ha also kind of have some ownership, at least over the interpretive value. Um, so again, the uh, additionally then the context, which is the framework where we all have to, that we all have to exist under to uh, critique or talk about art, um, which contributes to the interpretation of a work or which is like necessary for the interpretation of work, isn't owned by the ar artist. So, um, Again, this is an argument for kind of a collective ownership of some cultural works, especially with where there's no known individual creator, but it could also be an argument against co-option or appropriation of a certain art. So if you talk about, say, um, something the British Museum stole, like let's say, for instance, from the Greeks, if the if Greek culture existed to create the conditions that were necessary to create a certain work of art, then arguably, if there is no individual creator by which we can uh, ascribe ownership to, of that piece of artwork to anymore because it's old or something, we can still kind of say that uh, like the, the cultural uh, context are, are still responsible for the creation of the art. Therefore, Greek, Greece should get its artworks back. Uh, then we also have the idea the artist is always building on ideas or concepts or techniques that they did not invent. So for an, exa an example of this could be like some basic narrative structures that seem to have always existed, like the hero's journey. And another example could be genre specific. So like the fact that J.R.R. Tolkien is responsible for a lot of fantasy works existing in the first place because they were all building off con. Uh, of concepts that he kind of coined or invented. Um, and then you also have instances uh, where things are more like blatant. So like Elvis completely taking something that was uh, a musical tradition that already existed in the African-American community, introducing it uh, with a white face and getting a lot more recognition for it. Um, then we have talking very quickly about the death of the author. So this is a concept and a framework for literary criticism, which originated in a famous essay by a guy called Roland Barthes. And it argues the interpretation of art should attempt to consider the work in the absence of its creator. So this includes its so artistic intentions uh, or what they state that the art is supposed to mean, basically, and also biographical facts about the person. So. Uh, you might have like taken a poetry class at some point or uh, lit literature and maybe your teacher had the idea that you should talk, you should do some research on the bio bi biogra biographic information about like the person who wrote it and like some facts about their life that might explain why they had a certain worldview that could be injected into their book. But you might have also had a teacher who didn't want to do this. Um, and this can become relevant when you're considering the concept of separating the art from the artist. Uh, so a lot of the time when an artist gets cancelled or falls out of public favour, or maybe they, they uh, were around a long time ago and had some views that would obviously be unacceptable today, uh, people talk about separating their great work of art from the person that created it, which might be necessary to maintain your enjoyment of that work. Um, but might also arguably be removing context that could be important in interpreting like why uh, their uh, why their work might posit certain worldviews or why they their work might um, have questionable content or something like this. Um, so what is the argument for death of the author author? So the idea largely is that artistic intent is irrelevant if it's not realized and so it's interpretable. So if interpretation is another step in the artistic process, which is just as necessary as creating the art or having a vision for that piece of art, the way the, that an audience interprets a work is just as real as the author's intentions and the author's, author's later opinions about their work are themselves kind of a form of criticism and analysis. So they're not necessarily consistent with the message that was present in the past work uh, anyways. So we can probably grant that authors might still have somewhat of a higher authority in it, interpreting their work. Uh, and even if we posit that that wasn't the case, if we do allow authors to publicly interpret their own work, people will generally try and agree with them or they will have a perception of heightened authority. Um, and But this can also be an argument that uh, it's bad when authors do that because it limits the diversity of interpretations by proxy because people feel that they can't really do disagree with an author who kind of has like word of God when it comes to their specific um, piece of work. Cool, so part two, why art matters. So we're gonna get into a couple of practical things very quickly here. 
So the, here's the question, can art change the world? Does anyone think art can change the world? Yeah. Yeah. I think it probably can. Um, so yes is probably the answer. I think the example a lot of people tend to like default on when they're talking about if art can influence real life is the movie Jaws. Because after it was released, I believe sharks in a lot of locations, especially in the US, where it's a huge box office success, were culled. And there ended up being several populations of sharks or species of sharks, subspecies that ended up becoming almost extinct, be largely because of this movie made everybody really fucking afraid of sharks. Um, another example, and I don't have the picture on this slide because it's a little bit graphic, obviously, is uh, that famous photograph of the refugee boy who ended up drowning and washed up on a beach, I believe it was in Cyprus or Greece or something, um, which had a huge impact on public perception of refugees, at least for a while after it was released, because it was in every paper and it was on every website. Um, cool. And then a couple of things to note here, though, is that in the vast majority of debates, you're not going to have to prove that art has some impact on the world, but you'll be trying to explain why the influence of art is unique or exclusive. So what I mean by that is in a debate where you're talking about how it can help like social movements or something, nobody's doubting that it has the capacity to help them to some degree. Someone might dispute whether it, that has exclusivity, so that, and whether there's better ways to do it. Cool, so then what makes the influence of art unique? So the first thing is emotional response. So a lot of people uh, lack empathy for things that they feel aren't that proximate to them. And they have some apathy towards, especially when they're presented with some kind of crisis or something horrible happening. It's only presented to them in terms of numbers or statistics or news reports. But when you can access, uh, when you can access this person through the medium of art, you can stoke empathy and you can create the illusion of proximity because they can have that exp uh, experience uh, of the emotions that maybe like the person is going through by proxy, by experiencing it like vicariously through an artwork. Um, you can also have, ha you can also talk about how art affects the formation of people's worldviews. So we can't physically experience and see most like parts of the world. Media and culture has to inform our conceptions of the world significantly. So like for instance, I've never been to, um, I've never been to, I don't know, China. So pretty much everything I know about China is either from uh, news media or it's from uh, art. So any other kind of media. So movies or books or anything like that. The number of significant interactions then we have with for instance, certain people dwarfs in comparison to the number of similar fictional encounters. So this could I could talk about any geographic community that doesn't like reside in the UK or Ireland or Europe. I don't have that much experience with and I've probably actually seen it more in movies. We, we also then have a tendency to believe what we see represented in media is number one true and number two proportional to its importance. So, for instance, there's a lot of depictions of things that happened in World War II in media, but maybe there are less depictions of what, what has happened in other wars that didn't involve like European powers. And because of that, I tend to believe that like what I see about World War II is more important. Or you could also have this with like other kinds of tragedies. So the fact that like 9-11 is always depicted in media, but maybe other tragedies, uh, I'm trying to think of one, but the entire point is that it's tragedies people don't think about are depicted as much in media. So therefore I probably give them less thought and I also assume they have less importance. Um, I think this also probably extends to representation. So when you have maybe, uh, when you have like maybe protagonists in media who's who tend to be for instance, like men uh, are always represented and usually they're Caucasian. Um, people who aren't of the, uh, who aren't those types of people, when they don't see their issues represented in media, they tend to feel like society doesn't care about them or society doesn't feel their issues are important. Uh, and that can be like a negative impact of not experiencing that kind of representation. Uh, so quite a lot of art motions aren't art motions. And what I mean by this is a lot of them are emotions about social movements or they are emotions uh, about like economic inequality or access or something like that. And uh, I don't think that's a bad thing. I just think I would flag this now because I will be doing another workshop that's on social movements, but I'm not going to be covering a lot of that stuff here. Uh, number one, because those kinds of motions aren't actually art motions, but also uh, also because I think a lot of the arguments are so done to death at this point. 
uh, if you really want a rundown of what mo uh, what very common art motions are, especially ones that involve like representation clashes, I would definitely watch the Manchester Debate Union workshop where they kind of go through common motions and explain what all the arguments are. I didn't think that would be particularly useful here because I think everybody here has seen them already. Okay, uh, we're going to talk then very quickly, lastly, uh, about art as a reflection of social power structures. So uh, the, this is kind of the analysis you need to do if you want to prove this for an argument. So the type of art that gets made and platformed has to overcome gatekeeping. What this gatekeeping looks like is formal art education institutions. So a lot of the times these are expensive and exclusive. Art critics who tend to be of a certain social class. Uh, the same can be said for gallery owners or museum curators. Uh, and then also publishers and producers and the public. So the last two are pretty interlinked because publishers and producers want to make money and they rely on having a guaranteed audience in order to do so. Um, so and then when you're also by proxy, when you're trying to uh, when you're trying to be uh, pro profitable or when you're trying to appeal to the public, you're usually trying to appeal to majority groups. Um, and, and also just like people who have who have capital. So like people that are going to go see movies and spend money and stuff. Uh, what this means is that particularly particularly highbrow art and formal recognition for art. So like the Oscars or other award shows historically has been very exclusionary towards women and minorities, but also means that certain groups have lacked representation in art, especially popular media, even if they do have like an outsized effect on uh, some more niche forms of uh, of like art, because often art has tended to be like uh, radical or revolutionary or have the, a lot of political potential. Uh, but when it comes to things like formal recognition, some certain groups who don't have access to the to get past these forms of gatekeeping have less access. Uh, cool. So that's the end of the workshop. We're just going to do a debate now. I think there might be a couple extra 